everybody. Today is Friday, September 11th, 2020. I'm Bill Schaefer, and this is Growing Boulders. What's next? And you are here for an excellent program. It's going to be a lot of fun, very interesting, because coming up, you're going to meet a guy who had a dream, and he listened to everybody constantly tell him what a bad idea his dream was. Well, if this has ever happened to you, not only will he embolden you to perhaps give something a try in your life, but he will absolutely add a little bit of magic to your morning. You're going to want to hold on to your laptops for this one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Steve Marshall is a great guy. First, I do want to take a moment to mention that today is 9-11. That attack happened 19 years ago. Can you believe it? In so many ways, it, it seems like it was in the blink of an eye. So many people lost their lives and others have had their lives changed in many ways too. Look, none of us know what the next day is ever going to bring for any of us. We do know that we will all face unexpected challenges and obstacles. And we do know that it's important to live our lives to the fullest, but we don't do it. Events like this remind us how important it truly is. Don't wait for one day to do the things that you really wanna do. Don't wait for who you really, to become who you really want to be. Don't wait to say the things you really want to say to the people who are important in your life. Be who you really want to be starting now. Get out there and start making a difference in the lives of others because, as you know, that's what we call Growing Boulder. Do you know much about Growing Boulder? We're here to help change the way people look at Growing older, growing older, aging. It's not a time of loss and decline, as we've been led to believe by everybody, including ourselves. Aging is an opportunity, too. It's a chance for you to live your life to the fullest. Growingbolder.com is a great place to check out because, man, we've got stories there, interviews. There are real-life examples of ordinary people living extraordinary lives. And you can also learn about Growing Boulder TV, which is seen on public television stations across the country, Growing Boulder radio and podcasts, Growing Boulder magazine. Take some time to check it all out at growingbolder.com. It helps change the way you think. You know, when you are hanging around people who are positive, people who are doing things, people who think in, in, in an adventurous way, it's contagious. You know, speaking of contagious in the world we live in, get a little positivity in your life. It's good for all of us. All right, can't wait to get to Steve. Speaking of that, love his story because I think we can all relate. It's like I asked earlier, have you ever had something that you wanted to do only find out that all of your friends and everybody in your life tell you what a bad idea it really is. It's too difficult, low wages, few opportunities, little interest, poor lifestyle. Well, Steve Marshall, wanted to be a magician. So he asked his friends what they thought, and every one of them said, nope, bad idea. But it was in his heart. It was something he wanted to do. And you know what? He found out that his friends were pretty much right. It was hard. It was a constant struggle, and it still is. But when something is truly your passion, you cannot be stopped, not even by a pandemic. It's a story so big so important to get that what's next had to go global from Orlando, Florida, all the way to where is that? Shinjuku, Japan. Steve Marshall joins us now to talk about reinventing his dream, his life, and magic itself. Steve, Japan. Holy cow. I don't know how this connection is going to work. How are you doing? Uh, Bill san. Konnichiwa. Ima kara desu toka. Wait, Steve. Steve. Uh, uh, you're speaking Japanese. We can't understand a word you're saying. Just a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot the translation switch was on the wrong <laughs> side. Um, I switched over to English. We should be okay now. It might go off, but eh, we'll we'll try to keep it there. Well, How are you uh, doing? This is fantastic. I mean, to talk to you all the way in Japan and to allow us to call you collect is a is a is a very <laughs> thanks. That's, that's I accept the charges. That's a joke for anyone who remembers what a collect call. <laughs> really is. What what is Shinjuku? Where where is that? Well, actually, it's funny. You got Shinjuku off my Facebook page. Uh, Shinjuku is in Tokyo. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is Tokyo is not a city; it's a prefecture, like a state. And Shinjuku is one of the wards or cities in Tokyo. So I'm actually I actually live just outside of Tokyo, Japan, but 
Tokyo is the closest. That's where I do all my work, and I'm in Tokyo all the time. And it's a prefecture, folks. It's yeah. a prefecture, yes. The, you can go to Walgreens Tokyo. and get an ointment for that. An <laughs> ointment for my prefecture, yes. Prefecture. <laughs> so let, yeah, this is a great topic because I, I think what you've done is, is really interesting, especially choosing to be a magician. I'm sure that when you, I know you started when you were young, but, but when you decided you were going to make it your lifestyle, you probably did have everybody tell you, get a real job or you, you'll never, it's not the right path. How did you deal with that? And, and what made you, what gave you the ability to kind of ignore the noise and push ahead? Well, you know that, you know, the saying, they always say, have something to fall back on. Yeah. I never had anything to fall back on. I literally put all my decks of cards or all my eggs or whatever you want to say, all my magic wands were in one top hat, right? It was like, I, I never wanted to do anything else. Uh, when I was eight years old, now, I got to tell you, when I was a kid, I was the kid in school that got picked on. I was the overweight kid. I was the kid that got called fat. So I was the kid that got picked last for every sports team and PE. Um, I got bullied a lot. So I was always looking for something that would make me different. And when I was eight years old, I asked for a magic kit for Christmas. And it's kind of cool. This is, this is the box that I opened. This is so special to me when I was eight years old, this TV magic kit. And uh, this man's name was Marshall Brodeen, and it was a connection to me because my last name is Marshall. His first name was Marshall. And so I asked for this, and Santa Claus brought me this magic kit for Christmas when I was eight, and it literally just it changed my life because I could do something now that nobody else could do. Uh, it was a real – really broke me out of my shell during magic. But you know, Steve, it's it's like a hobby, though. And when you ch choose to make a career out of something that most people see as a hobby, you didn't pick an easy path at all. No, you know, my my dad's an accountant, and he always wanted me to go into the to business with him. And he always said, you know, son, you know, magic's a good hobby. Uh, it's something you can do, but it's not something you do as a career path, you know. And Along the way, I discovered clowning. There was a guy named Corky the Clown in Lakeland, Florida, who taught me clowning when I was a kid, when I went to this Red Cross youth clown troupe. So when I was in junior, by the time I was in junior high school, I was actually doing kids' birthday parties. And I come from Zephyr Hills, Florida, which in the wintertime, we have over 100 trailer parks there. So it's packed. And everybody was looking for entertainment. Well, I was it. It was me and there was a girl named Joyce who was a ventriloquist in town. And so we were the entertainment for all the senior citizen centers, the trailer park events, everything. And they used to call me up. They, they would call the high school because they knew I was in high school. The student secretaries would take messages, bring them to me in class. I would leave class, go to the pay phones at the time, book the show, and then go back to class. You know, so I was already making money and paying for all my magic props and things like that by the time I was in junior high school. So it's funny. I remember that TV magic kit. I remember seeing that, wishing I had it, you know, wishing and we all wanted to do that back then. But very, you know, the kids that could ended up really being the popular ones. But let's let's because of this program, let's switch to the to the other end of age. You, you barely look old enough even to be talking about an experience. Are, where are you in your career age wise and and how's it going now? Well, you know, I'm I just turned 55 last July. And, you know, it's, it's been this constant cycle of reinvention, right? When I graduated high school, I went to Ringling, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Clown College. And then I went on the road with Ringling for five years. And my fifth year was, it took me to Japan. They brought a unit to Japan. I really loved it here. I never in a million years thought I would be living here, right? Bought my souvenirs, went home. Uh, then I moved to New York City. I lived in New York thinking the old, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere kind of thing. Wound up doing very well there with corporate events. I was a street performer. I was a fire eater. You know, I mean, for, for years, every weekend, I would go out on the streets of New York and escape from a straitjacket and eat fire. You know, that was the way I, I paid my rent, you know, passing the hat and things. And then we've I would got, do corporate we've got events. A picture. We've got a photo of you eating fire. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. That, yeah, that was actually in the circus. That was when I was blowing fire in the circus. Man, so yeah. I can't so, yeah, imagine so, your parents not being proud of their son for uh, saying, "Well, he could have been a dentist, but no, he's my dad." My dad drove me 
to my first fire eating lesson. And it was a guy named Mark Young who taught me how to eat fire. And he used to work at Circus World. Remember Circus World in yeah. outside of Orlando? Yeah. Haines City. That's incredible. So, so, so you, it's like you, you sentenced yourself basically to a lifestyle where you never have a steady job. You never have a pension. You have no sick days. You have no office. You've been all over the country, usually working out of your car to get from place to place. What, what really, what, what has that lifestyle been like? I mean, it, you know, it's cool when you're on the stage, but in between shows, you know, it's, it, it, it's not a, a lifestyle for everybody. It's not. And, and, and a lot of people can't do it and they drop out or whatever. Um, I, it's funny. I was in my late twenties before I ever heard about sick days at work. Somebody was telling me about work and they said something about a sick day. And I went, a what? A, a sick day. What do you mean? You mean you can take off? Because for me, I've done thousands of shows and I never missed one. I was, when I was with Ringling for five years, we did two shows a day, three shows on Saturday. We were doing 13 shows a week for five years. I never missed a show. Wow. And I mean, there were some times where I was really sick and I went in and, and did the show. I would go out, perform, and then come backstage and collapse until I could go back out and do it again. Because when you're on the stage, something takes over. Um, and it's an amazing feeling. And it's unless you do it regularly, I don't think you can really understand. Um, but it's an amazing feeling. I love that. And the in-between times, yeah, it goes up and down. You got to you gotta learn how to manage your money because like September, October, November, December in a regular year, obviously not this year, are your busy years. And then everything kind of goes away in January, February until spring kicks in. So you got to kind of learn how to, you know, save your money, save your nuts and berries, as they say, you know, through the winter time. So you can survive, you know, for the, the real winter months. Um, and it's just been like that. And, you know, I, I'm extremely grateful that I've been able to do this. I'm, you know, I'm putting two kids through college right now. Um, we we bought this house in Japan. You know, I mean, it's it's been a great, it's really been a great career. And I have no regrets. And Steve, I love it. I'm glad you brought that up because that's an area that we tend to, as, as interviewers, we usually gloss over. Okay, so you followed your passion and yeah, it was a tough life, but you're doing what you love. We sometimes don't think about or talk about the financial end of that. Now, you knew it was probably a career where you would have to, like you said, save your nuts as you go along and be careful with the money that you get. But now you're at an, at an age, a life stage, where you're sending two kids to college, and 55, you're probably thinking, well, how long can I do this? How long do I want to do this? Do you, do you worry about yourself financially? Mm, I never have. Um, it's, always, it's always been there. There have been times where it gets really lean. When something like this happens or when the earthquake happened back in 2011 here in Japan and the tsunami, you know, entertainment is the is the first thing to go and the last thing to come back usually, right? Because it's not a necessity for people. Um, but during when the earthquake happened, everything went away. I immediately kicked it in and set up a lecture tour and a show tour in America and went for a month and a half and toured around um, with my buddy Billy Scadlock and drove all around, did shows. And a friend of mine who has a company up in Indianapolis, a, a good sized company, he said, you know, it's really amazing to me that your business is so fragile that one little thing can happen and everything goes away. But he goes, two weeks later, you've got everything back going again and you're out making money with something just totally different that you've just come up with in your mind. And that's the thing. You have to be able to reinvent yourself. You have to be able to be creative. You, um, you have to, you can't have an ego in a sense too, because it's like, if I got to go out and, if I was on stage last night in front of, 10,000 people doing this big show or on TV. And I was in China on TV for an estimated 100 million people. You know, next week I could be at some kid's birthday party, <laughs> whatever, if it comes up. Yeah. And I do it. You know what I mean? I, it's you just do what you have to do to, to make your money. Well, let's follow that because there are so many people in the same position that you are right now that never expected to be because of the global pandemic. People whose jobs have changed, people who are working from home still, people who lost their jobs or are trying to reinvent themselves as well. So here comes this global pandemic as as bad as it has been for everybody. Artists and entertainers, musicians uh, have really taken the brunt of this and have been 
really haven't had no way to, to make any income at all. And I'm guessing that, you know, you can, cannot afford not to work. So right. what have you done in this era to try to reinvent yourself and reinvent magic? Well, um, first of all, in the very beginning and still, I sit right in this chair every day and I teach English to Japanese kids um, on the internet. So I have like nine classes a day and my entertainment skills all come into play and, you know, just keep them involved. So that was, I'm still doing it, but that was an immediate thing that I could do to bring income in. And what I've been doing is I've come up with these online Zoom magic shows. I call it Steve Marshall's House of Magic. And for years, I always had this dream of setting a stage up to look like my, like my magic room, like here, where I come up with all my magic tricks, where I rehearse, where I read my books. My bookshelf is over here. And so now I can invite people right into my home over Zoom. So I've been doing these online shows. And it's a really unique experience because everybody has a front row seat. Everybody sees me doing the magic right here, right up close for them. How do you, uh, I'm how doing do you do, mind reading. How do you do magic on Zoom? Well, okay. <laughs> Think of it. It's like, it's. I don't want to say it's a TV show because it's not a TV show, but it's like you're watching a TV show. But it's like a TV show on steroids because you're actually interacting. Like I... I tell people to gather some items in their homes and I make magic happen in their homes. I'm in Japan. They're in the States and I'm causing things to happen in their homes. Um, doing mind reading tricks where I'm asking people to think of a word and I tell them what they're thinking of different things like that. So it's an, it's, a, it's something brand new. It's this totally interactive medium. Oh, you have got sometimes... to, you, you have got to give us an, an example <laughs> of what okay. that is. Cause it, well, let me let me just ask you. Let's try something. It's just you and me. But I'm, if everybody's watching, if they can like send a message in, I'm just really curious about this. Just to start out, I'm not yeah. sure if this is going to work or not. Okay. But um, no. But for, I've got something else. But right off the bat, I want to try one thing. Okay. So, Bill, I'm going to ask you some questions, oh, boy. and they're very simple. They're simple mathematical, very simple. Uh -huh. But I just want you to answer them out loud. Okay. And then. I'm going to ask you another question at the end that's not mathematically re related, and I just want you to think of. The first thing that comes to your mind, just blurt it out. Okay. All right. What's one plus one? Two. What's two plus two? Four. What's four plus four? Eight. What's eight plus eight? Sixteen. Name a vegetable. Corn. Corn. Okay. Was that the first? You changed your mind there for a second. There was a pause. <laughs> did you change? Were you going to say, you were going to say one thing and you changed to corn. Is that right? Right. What did you think I was going to say? What, what were you going to say? <laughs> I, I I cannot remember. <laughs> you can't remember, but it was it was actually it was a C. Here's what I thought you were going to say, and I'm just curious if everybody did that with us. If everybody thought of a vegetable, I'm, I'm curious what I had. It's interesting because I thought you were going to say it. You went um, in the bag. I had a I had a carrot. I, I actually thought you were going to say carrot. You, know, and you did I, go with corn with a C I blew, word. I blew your trick. No 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 you didn't. <laughs> I'm just curious if anybody else thought of it. Um, it, it just goes into something that I like to do. It's I've taught my kids um, to always have fun with whatever you do. And right now we're all having to sit at home. We're all having to stay at home. Um, we can't go out and eat, most of us. So I wanted to make mealtime fun for my kids. So what I did was I took a, I took a deck of playing cards and uh, I wrote the names of different, of canned food. So there's salmon, there's uh, cat's meat. Cat's meat, that's bad choice of words, meat for the cat. Um, it's uh, potatoes, condensed milk. We've got custard and peas, baked beans, hot dogs, vegetable soup, spaghetti. I've got, I mean, peaches. I've got all different things here. Uh, chicken soup, tomatoes, refried beans. Oh, there's carrots. Carrots, what I thought you were going to say. Uh, tuna. Uh, pumpkin soup. So I've got all these different fruit salad, pears. You get the idea. A whole bunch of different. So, Bill, what I'm going to ask you to do, since this is a deck of cards, is I want you to think of any card in the deck. Don't say it just yet. Just think of it. Because after this kind of got old, this little deal a meal thing, I decided to make it ramp it up, make it more fun. So I went in and I ripped all the labels off the cans in my uh, in my house. 
which wasn't really great for my wife, but I, I thought it was, I thought it was a lot of fun because then we could just reach in and grab a can. So we didn't have to do deal a meal. It was a surprise every night. So I've got this can with no label on it. I've got a deck of cards with a bunch of food written on them. Bill, name a card, any card. By you name the vegetable or name a card? No, name a card, any okay. card. What, what card would you like? The seven of diamonds. The seven of diamonds, the seven of diamonds. Okay. Look, I'm going to look through here. We're going to find the seven of diamonds. Let's see. Okay. Let's see, it should be in here somewhere. Oh, the seven of diamonds. There it is right there. Seven of diamonds. Okay. So that's the card that you wanted. And the, what's on the back of it? Can you read that? Pineapple. Pineapple. You like pineapples? I do. Okay. So you just thought, why did you think of the seven of diamonds? Was there any reason? I, I don't know. This is what's interesting, Bill. I have one can that's been sitting here the whole time with the label ripped off. You chose the seven of diamonds, has pineapple written on the back. Let's see how well you did. I didn't do so good with carrots, Steve. Now you're going to open nope. up a well, can of see. green beans. I know the suspense <laughs> is killing you here, Bill. We're going to open up this can. And interestingly enough, you thought of the seven of diamonds. And this is a can. Wow. Of pineapples. Nicely done. You redeemed yourself, Bill. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a little pineapple. Thank you. And so this is the kind of thing that you can do on a Zoom where you can actually talk to the people. Exactly. Who come to your show. So is it is it like for gr corporate groups or can anybody come to your show that um, way? How, do, how does that work? And it, so, so it can be, I've I had one family in Hong Kong hire me privately to do a show just for their family. Um, later on, we'll give my website. And on my website, I have a page about my virtual shows. And I sell tickets on Eventbrite. So I have shows every Friday and Saturday. Next week, I have one on Thursday. Um, so you go to Eventbrite, you buy a ticket. Uh, I'll tell you, the tickets are $25, but that's a household ticket. So you buy one $25 ticket, and that's per device that signs in. So if you're at home with your family, you're all watching on the same device. Some people plug it into their TV, and they see it right there. So it's $25 per household ticket on well, Eventbrite. That's really cool. I mean, it's it's changing. It's instead of limiting you to venues, the the venues are limitless, and anywhere in the world, and everybody, it's interactive. We can talk to you like well, you know, just like I would messed up your tricks there and guess no. Wrong. Well, it's fine. It's fun, especially if you're with a family or a group of people too, yeah. because you get to see everybody's reactions, and also, no matter where your family is in the world, even if you're all spread out, you can all log in and join in on the same show. And you're experiencing the show all together at yeah. the same time. See, this this is this is awesome. And again, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to reach out to you to have you on today is because there's a lot we can learn from you about uh, the price you have to pay to follow your passion, but the re the reward as well. You know, you've had you've had successes, real real big ones, and and you've had challenges as well. So talk to us about about that. What what can what can you teach us about how to not be afraid of, of you know, the tough times and, and how to deal with the good times. Well, I think, you know, I think it's important to follow your passion, whatever that is. Um, you know, my job is magic, but it's also my hobby. It's also the thing I love, my passion. So, you know, I never feel like I'm working. And, and I work relentlessly. If I've got a show coming up, there may be days where I don't sleep. I just go and go and go. Or if I'm coming up with a new routine, but it never feels like I'm working because I enjoy it so much. The time just flies by. Um, was it somebody said, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I really feel that way. And but then after a show's done, I collapse and I realize how hard I have been working and how many hours I have put in. And I always thought that if you ever wanted to do something, you should do it. It's like I always thought if somebody wanted to be a rock musician. You know, I'm not saying go out and quit your job and become a rock musician because that's probably not a good idea. But start a garage band in your home. If you can have some friends and play for local organizations. And even better, if you can start a family band. If you like to play guitar and you can teach your kids how to play guitar and your wife can sing, it's, it's like it's so much fun to do stuff like that. 
So I think that if you have a, a passion, I, I met a man here in Japan years ago, Suzuki San was his name. And he was an electrical engineer. He woke up, he got up, went to work at seven in the morning and came home, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night. He was just out all the time working, but he always had a dream. He wanted to be a painter and a poet. And when I met him, that's what he was doing. He was doing a lot of painting and poetry, but he was still an electrical engineer. And I asked him how he did it. He said, well, I wake up at four every morning and spend a couple of hours. I made a little studio in my home. So I spend a couple hours painting and writing poetry. And I said, oh my gosh. I said, aren't you exhausted? Because now you're losing two or three hours of sleep. And he said, no, I actually feel better and more alive than I ever have in my entire life because I've set some time aside to do what I'm really passionate about and what I love. And I think that's the key, even if it's shutting the TV off for an hour. And if you're right, like writing or painting, um, I'll, you know, a lot of people I, I hear their, their, their excuses, I don't have the time. And I always, the first thing I say is how much time do you spend watching TV? And, oh, you know, two or three hours a night. I, okay. Well, you have time right? You can turn the TV off for an hour, maybe miss the show or record it and watch it later. Um, I don't know. I just think there's always 15 or 20 or 30 minutes of time or even longer that you can carve out. And I think if you're doing what you're passionate about and what you love, it will really make the rest of your life better in the well, process. That's, that's great for getting you to give it a try, right? But here, here you are, you're in your mid fifties. And I'm, I'm guessing, Steve, there were probably times in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s when you're in your car by yourself driving from Zephyr Hills to uh, some small town in Georgia to do a convention or something that you're thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> Why don't I do something else and do this as a hobby? So what, what, has, what has sustained you? What has kept you pushing through for not just a couple of times or to give yourself a lesson, but to really, really live. You're living your passion. It's your lifestyle. Yeah. I had, a, I had another performer friend one time that said something. I couldn't believe somebody else thought this and maybe other performers did too. He said to me, he goes, do you ever fantasize about having a real job? <laughs> and I went, and again, in the sense that I go, yeah, you have a job from nine to five and then you clock out and you go home and you don't, think about it. Hopefully, you know, you just go home and do whatever you want to do for the rest of the night. That's, I'm, it's always in here. I'm always thinking about some new routine. I'm always thinking about something. I don't know what a day off is. Um, as a matter of fact, when I started doing this English teaching at the beginning of this, when that's all I was doing, it was from Monday through Friday. And it was the first time in 30 years that I remembered what a weekend was. You know, Friday night is you finish and then you don't have anything to do for two days. You can do what you want to do. It was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Right. And now with these shows and stuff like that, I'm back to, to all the time, which is fine with me. I love it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know though, if I can say there's ever been a time where I was going to give it up because like I said, that's all I know. I mean, this is all I do. And you know, when my big show isn't able to be sold because of something like this, I do close up magic. I do card tricks. I've got, I kind of jump around. I was a clown for five years, so I can always put my clown makeup on and go out and do shows as a clown if I need to, or um, I've got a lot of different things that I can do. I, I think, so. Steve, and I, I may ask you, I don't know if you have anything else you could show us, but be thinking of that. But uh, while I throw this thought out there, I do think, that usually, like if there, if you guys out there watching this, right, if, if you're thinking along the lines that Steve's talking about, you're probably thinking of something that's creative, something that's artistic, something that's musical, something that you do with your hands. You go, could be gardening, could be, could be anything like that. I think when you, it, it, that's the difference between a job and a passion, you know, a job where you go to work and you're doing something for somebody else. But when you're doing something like Steve, that comes from your heart, you don't really want time off. You, do, you don't want that, you, you get time off so you can spend time thinking about that. And that's why it's so freeing and so exciting and, and that so many people are interested in. Can you, Steve, how hard is it to, to pick up something? Do they have anything today like TV magic where you can maybe start to learn and, and, and just put on, you know, see how good you can get at it? Yeah, um, let me say one thing. It's funny when you were talking about just something that you're passionate about. My dad, was an accountant 
he had his own business and things like that. And when I graduated high school, he wanted me to come work with him. And I worked with him for a week. And it was like, I was just, I was bored to death. You know, it's not what I wanted to do. It was like, I shouldn't. But my dad, I remember when I was a kid, my dad would sit at the breakfast table and he'd be like adding numbers. And I'd say, what are you doing? He goes, I'm figuring, you know? And he was just, I, I to this day, I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he was adding or what he was, the bank account or whatever it was or something for work. But he loved numbers. He loved adding them and he loved figuring things out like that. So I saw him doing that and something that was like, I mean, I could never do it in a million years. He loved it. He was passionate about it. And he loved going to work and he loved, you know, tax time. He loved tax time, doing people's taxes for them, you know, and everything. So um, I grew up with that. So but, is there anything else you could show us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Putting you on the spot all the time. That's okay. I'm going to, you know what? I've got my, I don't know if you can see here, I've got my old Victrola here. So I'm going to. I'm going to crank it up in the best way I can with a little music. And I want to show you something that I carry with me wherever I go. Whenever I travel, I carry this around with me. And it's a, a giant die. And it's to remind me that life is sometimes like a game of chance, a roll of the dice, a crapshoot. And there's times in our lives when we just want to get outside of the boxes that we create for ourselves and expand our horizons. While at other times, no matter how cramped it might feel inside, it seems safer just to stay inside our boxes. No way. But what I'm here to tell you, what I'm here to tell you is that what I've learned in my life is that sometimes you just got to make your own box <laughs> and hope for the best. Oh man, that's great and it works great even through the internet. Steve, see let's let's start to wrap this up. You know, you've had such okay. an unusual life. Uh, we always Let me shut love... the patrol off. Hold on a minute. Oh yeah. <laughs> Stop and, it. And, and Rico Caruso sounds fantastic on. Yeah. <laughs> We, we always, whenever we have guests like you on, we always like to, to if you could give us a takeaway, like what, you've had such an interesting seat at life. You've done things that we could never do and, and we've, we're doing things that you wouldn't want to do. So what can we learn about life from what you've been through? Um, you know, magic is about astonishment. And there was a magician one time named Paul Harris who wrote an essay a about the moment of astonishment of why when you see a magic trick why it makes you go oh, i want to see another one and he said that as we grow up we have experiences in our life when we're born everything is amazing to us everything is astonishing the way warm wind feels on your skin the sound of a tree rustling uh rain everything is astonishing when you see it the first time then it becomes an experience that you put in a box and you stack it up but when the magician comes along and does a trick he does something you can't put in one of your nice, neat little boxes. And so they all fall away for a second. And that's that moment of astonishment before you start building it back up, trying to figure out how he did it. So years ago, I started doing photography and I started looking around at normal things in my neighborhood and in my life. And I started realizing that you can be astonished anytime. And when I walk down the street at different times of day, I see the way the sunlight is hitting a building or shadows uh, on the ground, or the way the leaves are moving or falling, just anything that's normal that you see every day, try to look at it in a new and interesting, astonishing way. And I think that that will just give you something every day, a little astonishment. And I think it goes a long ways. I get it. It's like adding a little bit of magic to our lives. And I understand it you're, is. you're it willing is. to allow our viewers today to add a little magic to their lives. Yes, I am. Yes. So I've got two shows. Uh, I've got a show tonight coming up, um, seven o'clock Eastern daylight time in the States. And I have one tomorrow night at seven o'clock. So Friday and Saturday night, Eastern daylight time. Um, the tickets are $25. But if you buy a ticket, I will give you two tickets for one. 
So if you buy a ticket at Eventbrite with the link on my homepage, then email me somebody else's email address and I will send you uh, a ticket for them. But for tonight's show, um, if you can do it in the next four hours, I'd appreciate it. Because I'm going to go to bed because it's midnight here. <laughs> I've got to get up and do the show. Oh, my gosh. It's midnight there. We're keeping you up. Let's, folks, so listen, if you're interested in contacting Steve, following him, or taking advantage of his two for the price of one offer to see one of his virtual magic shows, and we didn't even scratch the surface. This guy is talented, funny interesting, amazing. And here's all you have to do to reach out to him is go to stevemania.com. There's so much more to him too. You'll be fascinated by his photography, which there are links to and and just his story. I mean, I think all of us have things that we have thought about doing that we might have wanted to do. And who knows if uh, Steve made the right decision or the wrong one, but you know, he's living the life that he always wanted. No regrets, no questions. So Steve, I'll I'll give you the last word, uh, the growing boulder message as as we say sayonara to you in well in tokyo yeah thanks so i uh, just to be clear though for the for the two for one thing it's just for this weekend show there are other there are other schedules already up on eventbrite for other shows later on in the month but the two for one special is just for tonight and tomorrow night's friday and saturday night show this week um yeah thanks bill for having me on your show you know i think we we talked i I grew up watching you on TV. You were the guy. You were the guy I looked forward to seeing on the news because you did all the fun, positive pieces. Um, So this has been a real honor for me to be on the show with you. And yeah, I challenge everybody today to go out and be astonished by something, something you see every day, something that just look at it in a different way and uh, put a little magic in your life. It's beautiful. And come see me. (laughs) Great message. Steve Marshall, uh, we'll catch you next time you're in the States and uh, really appreciate Really appreciate the inspiration and a great message. And uh, hey, let's turn now to our meme of the week because it fits right in and it comes from the one and only Dr. Seuss, who was also just an amazingly creative person. You know, he lived at 87 years old. He was active up until the end. He wrote, my gosh, I guess most of the most popular children's books ever were written by Dr. Seuss, endearing to all of us because along with the amazing illustrations, did you know he did his own illustrations? You probably did. And the interesting alliterations that made his book so much fun to read were little, you know, these little chunks of wisdom, these interesting little tidbits of, of understanding and of humanity. And here's one of his quotes uh, that we really liked. Life is too short to wake up with regrets. So love the people who treat you right. Forgive the ones who don't and believe that everything happens for a reason. If you get a chance, take it. If it changes your life, let it. It's a great quote. And the key to life is opportunity. Opportunity is the most misunderstood concept too because it's all around us. But unless we reach out and grab it, it's invisible, it's pointless, it's it's worthless. And you really can't see opportunity unless you're actually looking for it. You have to get in the habit of looking for it, of seeing it, embracing it, and taking it. And when you think about it, opportunity, it's like its like the seed. You plant it, and what grows from opportunity is adventure, appreciation, and fulfillment. We all choose not to see most of the opportunities that come our way. We don't see them because we're too busy, or they're too risky, or because we're a little afraid. But again, opportunity is that seed that leads us in new directions, that offers different experiences that help make us better, wiser, and happier. So do this. Tell yourself you're going to put on your special opportunity-seeking glasses this weekend. See them. Think about them. And like Dr. Seuss said, and like Steve Marshall did, take a chance. Grab an opportunity. You'll be glad you did. I'm Bill Schaefer. We'll see you next time on Growing Boulders. What's next? Growing Boulders.